thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We might uh, we might make a start. Um, and I'd like to uh, begin by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're all joining from this afternoon. Um, I'm normally on Wurundjeri country, but today I'm instead on the beautiful and unceded lands of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pay my respects to our elders past, present and emerging. Um, encourage everyone just to, to pause for a moment and, and think about the traditional owners of the land that you're on today. Um, feel free to feel free to put that into the, to the chat to uh, to introduce yourself to everybody as uh, as we get started. Um, and we should also acknowledge, from a uh, First Nations perspective, the level of digital exclusion that's experienced by First Nations communities. The latest Australian Digital Inclusion Index told us out of the uh, 1,100 or so remote First Nations communities, are some of the most digitally excluded excluded in the country. Um, and I think really, uh, really worryingly that that gap is is continuing to uh, is continuing to, to expand. But uh, thank you for, for joining us today for the final Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance meetup of the year on a, on a really uh, important topic, I think, on the uh, the devices divide and shoring up the, the hardware component of, uh, of digital inclusion. My name is, is David Spriggs. I'm the, the CEO and the chair of the Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance. And I'm delighted today to be joined by uh, three leaders in, in the field. Um, so we'll be hearing today from Caroline McDade, the, uh, the CEO of WorkVentures, from Jess Wilson, the CEO of Good Things Foundation Australia, and uh, Kevin Teo, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at, at Kingfisher. And we'll, we'll get them to introduce their work in a, in a moment, but a, a quick piece by way of introduction for, for each of them. So Caroline is a strategic and impact focused executive with experience across the commercial, not-for-profit and social enterprise sectors. She became the CEO of Work Ventures mid last year, leading Australia's first technology based social enterprise. Incredible to think 43 years of, uh, of social inclusion through the use of, through the use of technology. Um, and was delighted earlier this year, they received an award at the Not-for-Profit Technology Awards. It was a lifetime service award for Walter de Jong and Caroline's team, who has been at Work Ventures over 38 years, which is just absolutely, absolutely incredible. Um, so wonderful organisation and thank you so much, uh, Caroline, for, for joining us. Um, we've got Jess Wilson with us. Jess is a seasoned social impact leader with experience spanning the public and not-for-profit sectors. Um, Jess uh, joined the Good Things Foundation when it launched in Australia in 2017, is their national director and became CEO in, in July of last year. And many of you would know um, Good Things Foundation Australia has just celebrated its fifth birthday and I know a number of us were there as, as part of that. So wonderful to have you with us, Jess, and thank you so much for joining us. And we've got Kevin Teo, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at Kingfisher. Um, Kingfisher is focused on creating a system that allows 100% of connected devices to be returned, repurposed and recycled with trust and reliability. Um, they've recently partnered with Australian Telco Belong, part of Telstra, to, uh, to power the Second Life store, offering high quality, affordable refurbished devices. And Kevin has a, has a really strong background in, the, in both the corporate and the, and the telco sector. So uh, thank you, uh, Kevin, for, for joining us today. Um, a little bit of little bit of housekeeping. Um, the session's being recorded and will be available after the uh, after the event. Um, please make sure you're subscribed to our ADIA newsletter to receive a copy of that. And Caitlin will probably put a link to that in the chat. So if you're not already subscribed to our newsletter, please do so. Um, we're going to start today by hearing from each of our panelists, and then we'll open it up for for Q and A. Um, but we'd love everybody to put your questions into the Q and A box as we go, um, and please put any please put any comments into into the chat as well. Um, and if you're using the the chat, just make sure you're sending your message to everyone or the panelists and all of the attendees, rather than rather than just a, an individual. Um, but before we get started, just a little bit about the Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance for anybody who hasn't joined one of our meetups before. So the, the ADIA was established following the, the National Year of Digital Inclusion in 2016. 
um, <clears throat> founded uh, initially by Info Exchange, Australia Post, Google, and Telstra, but now uh, now a shared initiative with over 500 business, government, academic, and, and community organisations, and really working together to accelerate the pace of, of digital inclusion. Um, back when we formed the alliance, there was the discussion: should it be a digital inclusion roundtable? And we said, no, we want this to be action oriented, and hence why it's the Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, our vision is to build a digitally inclusive Australia where everyone is equipped to fully participate in society and the economy. And we've still got a lot of work to do. The latest digital inclusion index that, that came out showed us that 17% of the Australian population is still highly excluded. And we know that the number of people without the skills and confidence is much larger than that again. So a, a massive, a massive uh, challenge that we have. Um, and our kind of focus at the ADIA is in three core areas, one on digital ability, on accessibility, and then, uh, and then affordability. Um, and that's probably a good segue into, uh, into, the, into today's discussion um, on devices. And we know digital inclusion is, is really a multifaceted challenge, um, but access to appropriate and affordable devices is a really critical part of the, the digital inclusion puzzle. Um, even just how we define devices and what type of devices are appropriate is a, is a big enough question by itself, and we'll, we'll get on to that today in the, in the webinar. Um, but we thought today, the purpose of today's session, really to gain an understanding of the landscape in terms of device reuse and looking at issues like refurbishment and, and redeploying through, uh, through the organisations we're, we're speaking to. Um, and acknowledge that you know we're really fortunate to have three leading organisations on the webinar today, but I think all of us would say none of us have all of the answers. Um, so we'd, we'd love to hear from you as well in the chat about initiatives that, that you're aware of. Um, and please get in contact um, with us through the website digitalinclusion.org.au if you want to follow up with us, with us afterwards. Um, so I think uh, that the other acknowledgement I'll just make up front is you know, clearly access to a device is not everything. Um, and as I said before, you know, our focus is also very much on ability and, and accessibility. Um, but today's discussion around uh, around devices. So I think that's uh, I think that's probably enough from me. Um, but delighted to uh, to welcome our first speaker to Caroline McDade to, to talk about some of the wonderful work that uh, that Workventures is doing in this space. So over to you, Caroline. Thanks, David. Um, and just acknowledging I'm on uh, Wollamodigo land right now. Um, uh, Work Ventures is actually based in Camigo land. So I know acknowledging um, the First Nations people of those, those lands. Um, so yeah, thanks, David. As you said, Work Ventures has been around for 43 years. Um, and during those last four decades, as I'm sure you can imagine, we've seen many pivots in the way that we address barriers to social inclusion. So for many years, our focus has been on acting as a bridge between corporate end of life technology and those who are digitally excluded. So we work with corporates, large and small, to decommission, collect and safely sanitize the data of their donated end of life corporate technology, which is primarily laptops, monitors, PCs. We also do work with mobiles, but to a lesser extent. Um, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide, please, Caitlin. Thank you. Um, so we've been doing this for some corporates such as Westpac for many for several decades and have built up a reputation of trust. Um, they can rely upon us to safely manage their data and that the devices will be used for an impactful purpose. So managing the device donation supply side is as important to us as managing the end user experience. Without our device donors, we wouldn't be able to support digitally excluded cohorts. So the process is built around what I call the three S's, security, seamlessness, and sustainability. So security is really at the heart of all that we do. Physical security when collecting and storing the device, data security when we're wiping the device and providing certification that's been done so. The process needs to be really seamless to our donating partners. We need to be responsive to fit into their timelines when performing technology refresh projects we need to be able to manage their assets seamlessly and provide reporting that outlines where any asset is at any point in time. And lastly, sustainability is a big driver for most of our donating partners. So we provide sustainability reporting that outlines how the device has been used, whether it's been used in our digital inclusion programs, stored for future use, used for parts or sustainably e-wasted. So we provide full sustainability reporting on that. 
Um, the donating partners also, also have to be really comfortable that our programmes are sustainable and that we have the right infrastructure in place to continue supporting disadvantaged cohorts into the foreseeable future. As a not-for-profit ourselves, we can also provide charitable receipts for device donations. However, in our experience, this is not often a big motivator for the decision makers. On the distribution side, we then work with not-for-profits or directly with end users to make sure that the devices that have been donated um, are given or provided to those that need them the most. Um, so as a social enterprise, we do this in a way that maximizes our impact. So we're also a group training organization and we provide employment opportunities for young people, often from diverse backgrounds. Um, our trainees come in and work towards an IT qualification, whilst getting real hands-on experience in refurbishing devices or supporting the end users of those devices, which I'll go into um, a bit later. Um, in the last year or so, what we've done is provided, uh, broadened this approach a bit. Um, so initially it was all about the device. Um, now what we've, um, we've broadened our, our support to address more holistic digital inclusion. As David was saying earlier on, you know, devices are not the, not the solution on their own quite often. So we often we know that having that access to device alone is not enough to ensure true digital inclusion. There's also the matter of building digital skills and access to connectivity. So we also see some of the barriers identified in the Australian Digital Inclusion Index, such as fear of being hacked, really blocking people from, um, from becoming digitally included. So we use that device at the heart of our approach to digital inclusion, but then we layer on additional solutions to address the specific barriers that we're seeing. So, for example, we can preload software onto the device to help overcome online safety concerns or to support schooling. We often um, we provide over the phone digital coaching calls that are delivered by those IT trainees I mentioned, um, and they help recipients to get online, navigate the devices, etc. Um, we can also remotely manage devices for those that need an additional level of support in getting set up. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please, Caitlin. Thanks. Um, so we work with a range of not-for-profits to roll out these digital inclusion um, bundles. So we work with them to create bespoke solutions that really address those barriers that I mentioned. Um, and often the barriers are quite unique to the cohorts we're working with. So we work with a range of digitally excluded cohorts, including students from disadvantaged backgrounds, seniors, job seekers, residents of housing commissions and First Nations communities. And each of those cohorts face slightly different sets of challenges. So for example, we're working with Anglicare Tasmania right now. As you can see, there's a, a bunch of um, partners on that slide there, and to really represent our partners on the not-for-profit side and also our partners on the device donation side. So we, we, we are that bridge as I mentioned. Um, so Anglicare Tasmania, we're working on a cohort of seniors. Um, and so our focus with them is really addressing connection, online safety and basic skills. Um, solutions that we, so we, we build up a solution to address each of those barriers all around the refurbished device. Um, on the other hand, our work with the Smith family is different again. Mm -hmm. We're working with students and their families and it's important that they are set up for success. So we have a team of digital coaches call each family to ensure that they are comfortable navigating the device and all the installed hardware and software, as well as getting online and really managing and understanding their internet allowance. And um, because quite often it'll be the first time those families have gone online. Um, and the focus in all of these cases is really to make the experience as seamless as possible. So we know that digital exclusion is often a symptom of broader disadvantage and digital exclusion reinforces the disadvantage by preventing positive educational outcomes, preventing participation in the digital economy or preventing community engagement. So by reducing the barrier to digital inclusion, we have a great, greater opportunity to reduce overall disadvantage. And to do this, we need to make digital inclusion easy, which is the focus of Work Ventures. So we communicate simply to the end users, we're empathetic, and we aim to reduce that fear and stigma. Thanks, David. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline, for, for sharing those insights. And I, I love I love a few things. One is the the fact that you're a true social enterprise in the in the work that you do, which I think is amazing, um, but which also incorporates, as you say, that GTO element of, of training. Um, it's just an, an unbelievable, an unbelievable model. Um, and great to hear on, on some of those projects how you're also incorporating kind of all those elements of connection and cyber security and, and skills within that. So thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing. And a reminder to everybody please um, put put your questions as we go for our panelists into the into the q a button um, and please make any comments through the through the chat as we're going as well um, but i'll move now to uh to jess wilson ceo of good things foundation australia and i think jess is going to talk to us about some of the about some of the wonderful work good things is doing here in australia i think as well as some of the international insights from uh, some of the work going on in the uk so over to you jess Thanks, David, and thanks, Caroline. It's great to be here today and to be part of this um, really, really important conversation and from people from different parts um, of the, the system, I suppose. So um, I'm coming to you today from Gadigal country um, in the office, uh, Good Things Foundation, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and say, you know, I think that although, David, you know, there is a continued issue um, around the digital divide for our um, First Nations communities, there are also amazing people doing work in this space. Um, so, you know, having just been in around the country a couple of weeks ago at the Indigenous Digital Leaders Forum, there are some amazing young leaders coming up um, that have great ideas about how to, to lead in this space. So I think, you know, there's, there's some hope there for sure. Um, so yes, I'm from Good Things Foundation. Um, a lot of you I've seen on the uh, on the um, the participant list. Um, I, I've seen or know your name, so it's great to be amongst friends today. Um, and I suppose you probably know a bit about Good Things Foundation. We've been in Australia here for five years, as David said, but we also have a came from the UK, and so our organisation, Good Things Foundation, in the UK turned eleven. Um, this week. So, um, so they have been doing this um, focus on fixing the digital divide for, for all of that time. If we can just shift to the next slide. Thanks, Caitlin. I mean, really, that the focus of our work um, in, in Australia to date has been around building digital ability. So our focus has been around building confidence and skills. And we've done that through building and supporting a network of community organisations across the country. And I know some of them are on the line today. Um, and that's really about supporting people to build their confidence, their strengths and um, their, their safety online. And we know that those programs have been really successful. So Be Connected is one of them. We've supported people um, to build their digital health literacy. And we're working with different partners to, um, to build the confidence and skills of people with um, intellectual disability and a range of others. So um, it's fantastic to be talking about that. But I suppose what we saw um, during COVID, and I won't talk about our ability programs today because I've talked about them a lot and I know many of you have heard me speak about them before. So if we just go to the next slide, Caitlin. I suppose when we saw um, during COVID was that we knew that people just didn't have devices at that time and how essential it was. And so what we could do during COVID here in Australia was to shift some of our grants programs. We deliver the Be Connected Grants program that supports community organisations to build their digital inclusion programs. Um, and we created a new grant that enabled people to purchase um, devices to give to people in their community. So it's a, it's a loan device kind of um, model. And that's worked really well. We've distributed over a million dollars worth of grants in that space. Um, and that's fantastic. However, we have also seen um, that um, that there's still a need, a huge need out there. So we recently did a survey with our network and over 80% of them said that they still saw a need for devices in their community and people in their community. So it's a significant issue. Um, and I think it's an interesting one. And I know we're going to have this conversation about what kind of device is necessary for people. Um, but I think certainly that the, the appropriate device for what you're trying to do is really, really the key here. But likely, likewise, in the UK, they, they also saw a very similar issue during COVID. Um, and, you know, the UK has a significantly higher population and um, and so, um, you know, significant numbers of people really, really needed support during that COVID time as well. So the UK earlier this year, currently while I was actually away for a few months, 
um, uh, had released a new strategy. And so can I just go to the next slide, please, Caitlin? And that, that strategy is really including three key pieces to that. Um, one is the National Digital Skills um, Digital Inclusion Network. So that's basically focused on support. That's what we've always been doing. But they've also established two new parts of that service. One is a national data bank, which provides the opportunity for different telcos to put um, data into one place that can then be distributed out to community organisations through that National Digital Inclusion Network, and then also um, a national device um, bank. And this is, again, to enable corporates and individuals to donate devices that are no longer needed, to be refurbished, a bit like what Caroline's been talking about already, um, and then to be gifted um, for free to people in need um, in the community. So that's really the piece that I'm going to talk a bit about today. Um, just to, to say that I think in co during the COVID times when there were significant lockdowns, the UK did distribute about 22,000 um, devices and, and SIMs to people in need, but they were mostly new devices. They got donations of funding to be able to purchase those devices to be able to distribute. So that's, that's fantastic and that worked really well. Um, but I think it's this opportunity to really think about how do we make sure we're bringing both um, environmental and social impacts together. That has really driven this, this focus um, for the team in the UK. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'll just kind of talk to you a bit about what the device bank is and how it works. Um, the, the UK are not being, um, the team in the UK are not being picky about who can donate devices. They're getting devices from all over the place. Um, and you can see, I'll put in the chat panel later a, a link to the, the website so you can have a look, look in more detail about what kinds of things they're looking for. Um, but the, the, we have an organisation that donates the devices. They're working with a refurbished partner, a refurbishing partner, a bit like Work Ventures, who does all of the same things. So devices wiped and um, and um, accredited. Um, if they're, although we do know that not all devices are usable, and so um, you know, I think they've they've had to date around twenty thousand devices that have been donated. And quite a number of those have not been able to be used for refurbishment, but they can be used for recycling and there is an opportunity to be able to um, reinvest the money that they've been able to generate through that process back into the device bank um, to be able to do that. They also really clearly pair the devices with the um, with data. So because it's really important that people also have the ability to connect to the internet at the same time. And then the devices and data are distributed through the network of um, community organisations. They make the decisions about who is eligible for this. The, 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 the requirements around this are, you know, there's a, a very minimal requirements. We know that community organisations know who the people are that need these, this, this device and this data. And so it's really important for us to be trusting those community organisations. We know early on in the, some of the pilots for this that people were quite harsh and um, were actually harsher than we thought we needed to be around who could who could um, who could access that device. And so it was really about making sure that this is an opportunity for people to to if they need this support to be able to better um, you know access health, education, jobs. That's that's what they need it for. And so this is the whole intention of. Of this and then ultimately people are able to to access that to improve their lives so really that's the the process of the device bank it's reasonably new so it has established in about march this year and um so that so they they're still working on what this actually looks like and how you know what kind of scale they've got of course at good things foundation we're very focused on how can we make impact at scale um, for individuals. And so um, that's the intention. Um, and they're learning a lot on the long, along the way, even about how we talk about um, the whether it's a donated device or the kinds of language we need to use to shift 
um, how we're positioned in the in the market, I suppose, of refurbishment and reuse of, of devices. So it's really exciting. And I think, you know, Caroline and I have been talking for a little while about how we might be able to do something like this here. So if there are people that are interested um, in working on this kind of approach here, please get in touch with us because we are really keen to, to look at how we might be able to make this work in an, in an Australian context. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, David. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. And lots of good questions coming through in the Q&A and the, and the chat. Please, please keep them coming. Um, but yeah, fantastic to hear, Jess, about the, the device bank. So I'm, I'm sure you're working hard to bring the, to bring the same to Australia because it's, it's critically needed, the, the device bank and the, and the data bank. Um, and also really, I, I think, um, you know, an amazing accomplishment during COVID to actually pivot your grant program to be allowing people to get access to devices. We know that is not an easy thing to suddenly pivot a massive grant program that was designed for skills into, into devices. So, so well done, that was, that was incredible work. Um, so keep, keep questions coming, um, but we're going to go now to, uh, to Kevin Teo from, uh, from Kingfisher. Um, so we've just heard from two wonderful not-for-profit organisations. And I think Kevin potentially brings a bit of a different perspective. I think it's, it's wonderful, a commercially focused organisation um, that's very much having social impact and, and contributing to, uh, to the devices challenge. So over to you, Kevin. Thanks very much, David. Um, and I live in Ghana land, so I would like to pay my respects to uh, their elders, past, present and emerging as well. Hey, super, super inspiring um, hearing from both Caroline and, and Jess and the amazing work that they and their organisations uh, do for this and, and delighted to be part of this panel and, and talk about uh, potentially not just how corporations can um, add value to this system, but also us as individuals and consumers, because, you know, this is such an important topic. Um, which requires uh, not just action, but a huge amount of awareness as well. And, and corporations can obviously play a huge role in that. But um, what I thought I might focus on um, in, a, in a couple of slides and some information here is the concept of circularity and how the concept of circularity in the device ecosystem can ultimately enhance and enable the brilliant work that uh, the organizations that Caroline and Jess lead and others um, you know, uh, lead around the world. And, and I might start with the concept of circularity and what, what you know, we at Kingfisher think about circularity and define it as. And in really simple terms for, for mobile devices, for example, we think about it in the context of how often is the device not just used, but how often is it returned, refurbished, recycled, and then reused? And, and how many lives you know, can a device have uh, as part you know, of a device ecosystem? There's something like 6 billion smartphones in the world already today and another billion feature phones. Um, so that's pretty much one for every human being, you know, on, on the world, which is quite phenomenal. Um, but the interesting data point that, that we've observed and, and, and I've been going around the world talking to many global uh, mobile phone carriers is what's the ratio of when a new device is sold, how often a device is returned when that new device is sold. Um, you, you may be surprised, but the incidence of that in particularly Western world countries is as low as 20 to 25%. So if you think about that, what is happening to those old devices? Some of them, no question, are being reused and repurposed. Uh, Hand-me-downs, you know, I know I give my old phone sometimes to mum and dad or the kids and the like, but many, and I'm sure all of you can probably relate to this, are sitting in a drawer somewhere. Um, or in the worst case, you know, ending up in landfill. And, and that is not great uh, for the world uh, in so many, so many different ways. So in terms of how we think about circularity, you know, our ambition and our, our vision from a, a Kingfisher perspective, uh, being the organisation I work with, is how do we get to one-to-one? -one? How do we get to a world where, you know, we've got that true circularity and those devices being used not just once, but twice, three times, four times? Um, I'll, I'll quote uh, a, a, a passage from a, a white paper that was just released um, by the GSMA, which is the, the, the global body uh, representing mobile carriers around the world, um, where they talked actually about circular economy. And they said, extending the lifetime of all smartphones in the world by just one year has the potential to save up to 21.4 million tonnes of CO2 emissions annually. And to put that into context, that's equal to taking more than 4.7 million cars off the road. So we have a huge opportunity here 
from a sustainability perspective, and I think that's pretty obvious to everyone around how we can improve the planet. But I think maybe what's not mentioned as often is how the circular economy can actually enable and sustain accessibility as well and help close this digital divide. And so um, what you can see on, on the slide up here is this concept of how enterprises and corporates, not just Kingfisher, but mobile phone um, companies and the like, can find ways in which to leverage the ecosystem of secondhand devices in the market uh, to create value uh, for both customers, for carriers, um, but really importantly also deliver a, a greater number of devices into the ecosystem for accessibility. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, um, what that essentially means you can see here is that it's more than just recycling. It, it is actually about um, greater extension of lifetime and reuse um, to the point where um, you're not just creating greater environmental benefits, um, but, but accessibility benefits as well. Now, one of the most important things here um, that we've identified talking to global carriers around the world is that it's not just about the intent um, and the, the great sort of moral benefits um, and, and, and great sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, way in which we can, we can leverage people's good spirit. You ultimately need to, to create disruption through amazing customer experiences. And so that's one of the things that we've been focusing on and we've been focusing on working with um, our different telecommunications companies around the world on is how do you create a great value for consumers and an incentive for them to return devices whenever they're upgrading uh, or buying a new one. And so trade-in programs, right, which, which create a really easy and seamless way for customers to get their device uh, assessed and, and get a value for that, um, making more making that more aware. Um, we have a program uh, with Telstra and, and working with uh, other carriers around the world as well, where we can help customers um, upgrade the devices, um, but when they do have a big, big incentive to return the devices um, through that upgrade and a financial incentive to do that. And so through those types of customer experience benefits, you can drive this ecosystem. And so that's one of the things where I think when we think about where corporates can help, um, some of the, the greatest innovations come from customer experience innovation. And, and that's um, one of the things that we're so focused on. And if you go to the next slide, um, it means that ultimately we can create a win-win-win type scenario. We don't have to have people that lose, you know, in this ecosystem when we're trying to create greater circularity. Uh, as you can see here, you know, uh, better for the environment, um, better for customers, um, and also better for mobile phone companies. Um, look, finally, um, the, 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 the other way in which we can help from uh, an accessibility perspective is obviously from an affordability point of view. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, we've been working, as David said, with a company called Belong, which is a subsidiary of uh, Telstra, uh, led by an amazing uh, colleague, former colleague of mine, Yana Katako, who is doing some amazing things. The, the team is doing amazing things here um, from a, a sustainability uh, perspective. And so we partnered with them to uh, launch a second life device store, um, really the, the first um, significant one of scale uh, in Australia, where um, really devices that might have otherwise, um, uh, you know, would, would be out of out of reach for, for people from an affordability perspective, um, you know, can be given to them and, and, and delivered to them at price points, which are much, you know, much more accessible. Um, so that they can have the best technology uh, for their needs um, uh, without having to fork out literally thousands of dollars. Um, so that's one way in which, you know, from an awareness perspective, um, we can continue to build build this ecosystem. So, David, I might leave it there. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kevin. And yeah, wonder, wonderful to hear of that as a as that circular model and that circular model working, you know, working at scale to uh, to address to address the challenges we've been talking about. Um, I like the the incentives for customers as well and how people can put that into the telco model. And I will definitely remember your stat for the. Uh, you say if we, we extend mobile life by one year, that's the equivalent of 4.7 million cars off the road. I think that's, uh, we often hear about this kind of millions of tonnes and people have, you know, had difficulty visualising that, but 4.7 million cars, that's, uh, that's incredible. So th thank you, Kevin. And there's been some great questions and comments coming through in the in the Q&A and the, the chat. So please, please keep them coming. Um, I just thought I'd kick off with a question though, kind of back to um, what I mentioned in my introductory comments around 
this that whole piece around how we define devices and what is an appropriate device. And I had a personal example of that last night. One of our family friends who's in his early 90s called me saying, I need to get a new device because well, apparently I'm on Windows 7 and it's not supported anymore. And I think I need a laptop, but I'm not sure. Do I need a laptop or do I need a desktop? Or somebody mentioned all in one. What are all these things? Um, but maybe opening that up to the panel and just, you know, how, how do you look at what's what's an appropriate device? And when people ask those questions around, you know, is it a mobile? Is it a tablet? Is it a laptop? Um, how, how, do you, how do you think about that? And, and how do you look at answering some of those questions? And I wants to kick that off, Caroline, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll have a go, David. I think um, the answer kind of rather annoyingly when it comes to the bare minimum requirements is it depends, you know, so it really depends on the nature of the task being performed, the, the breadth and the diversity of the tasks being performed, and also the level of, the sk level of skills required to navigate the tasks, you know, do they involve a higher level of skills such as research multitasking or kind of navigating multiple applications so in in our experience smartphones are really excellent for simple short tasks that require low you know, lower levels of concentration like social browsing basic communications that don't require a high level of multitasking um, and are really great for tasks that have been specifically designed for smartphones such as you know the mygov apps have done a pretty good job of of um, the smartphone experience. However, on the flip side, uh, smartphones don't always lead to a complete digital inclusion solution. Um, smartphone only access tends to correlate to a lower level of skill and a less, a less diverse use of the web. Um, and in some cases, if people are trying to use smartphones for more complex tasks, it can actually even create more points of friction and it can reinforce digital exclusion. Um, one example, just to kind of bring that to life, would be, you know, high school student, which is we support lots of students um, cohorts. If you imagine them trying to do an assignment on a smartphone, um, while it's kind of technically possible, it would lead to high levels of frustration. You know, you're trying to research on a web app, accessing multiple data points, trying to toggle between that and a word processing app like Google Docs or Microsoft Word, maybe even throwing in a bit of PowerPoint or Excel sheets, you know, you can pretty quickly understand why students might decide that school or learning is not for them and just kind of give up in frustration. And I guess that example can kind of be extrapolated across other cohorts like job seekers, you know, researching employers, writing a CV, preparing for an interview, and you can start to see the limitations of smartphones when it comes to some of these more complex examples. Um, on the flip side, from what we've seen, access to non-mobile devices um, such as tablets, laptops, and PCs, if it's done in a way that supports the basic needs, you know, and it provides some um, some training, digital skills, it really encourages exploration and discovery, and it actually then has a, a, a kind of positive reinforcement, and it develops, it allows the individual to develop a higher level of skills. Um, but that said, in our experience, you know, those, you, you still need a basic level of um, minimum requirements for it to be useful. So it's too old or too slow. It tends, again, to be counterproductive. You get frustration, inevitably a decision that technology is not for me um, and people kind of down tools and walk away. Um, so in our experience, not to kind of get too, at the risk of getting too technical, we find a kind of eight gigabit RAM is generally the lowest we'd go and anything older than a, a fifth generation laptop, there's just a risk of software obsolescence that can create more security vulnerabilities and potentially put already vulnerable people at increased vulnerability. Fantastic, thanks Caroline. Jess, did you wanna jump into? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, I support everything that Caroline's, Caroline said. I mean, I think that one of the challenges that we have with mobile is actually the, as, as you were saying, that the, what you're trying to do with it and that some of the systems that are created now are not, are still not, um, accessible using mobile phones. So, you know, like even though they may, you know, some systems are mobile optimised, but the others are not. And so it makes it really difficult. So I think it's not just about, you know, people's skill and the actual device. It's actually then about the systems that are and that are created for people to access. So, I mean, I've just seen a comment in there about MyGovID and people having to update 
and because of the MyGov ID. I mean, you actually to have MyGov ID, you have to be logging in on a computer and have another device. So that kind of two-factor authentication piece. So it's it's the, the systems that are being created, although you can use mobile devices, um, they're not really, um, they're not always set up in that way. Um, to date. So I, I think it's not just about personal responsibility always, it's actually about how those systems are designed for people to access. Yes, I've just seen the NDIS portal. Exactly, exactly. Um, it, is a, it is a huge challenge for people. And I, I mean, I did see someone um, at one of our Get Online Week events, you know, an older gentleman who was, you know, had a smartphone-ish um, and you know, could kind of, but it, the screen was like this big and he was trying to access the Be Connected website. And even though that's mobile op optimised, that device just wasn't possible for, for him to access that kind of learning, so. Yeah, fantastic, thanks, Jess. And as, you, as you both said, kind of fitness for purpose, but then working, um, through, that, working through that that whole challenge. There's other questions kind of coming through on device quality as well. And I don't know, Kevin, whether you want to start with that, but certainly Caroline and Jess, please, please jump in as well. But kind of people thinking about, well, if it's this, this second-hand device, you know, is it going to have the capacity? What's the battery going to be like? Is it going to look broken? Yeah. You know, the security, all yeah. of those sorts of elements and, and how you address those. I think it's a great question. And, um, you know, uh, I think Caroline mentioned, right, there, there's risk, I think, if you deliver devices that aren't fit for purpose to the people that, you know, need them. Uh, it's going to actually increase the the challenge um, because people won't be able to use them in the right way or not going to be able to get get what they need out of them. And obviously, security is such a big issue right now. Um, there's no question about that. People's fear factor on that is is high, uh, and rightly so. Um, I think what it means is that having um, reputable organisations, uh, including sort of corporations, um, you know, contributing to donating time and effort uh, to helping in terms of things like security, uh, data wiping. Um, and doing it you know, to the highest levels that they would do for corporations um, when providing those services is really, really important. Um, I think you know, another factor is the higher end and the more recent devices are naturally going to have more features and functionality that will allow for you know, better security, better protection, and better usage of those types of systems that Jess talked about. And so part of the challenge, I think, from a supply perspective is how do you get those more recent devices back from people to the extent uh, that you can? Because there's probably a lot of, you know, third, fourth, fifth generation devices floating around in people's drawers and the like, but they're not necessarily as user friendly and able to do the things that, you know, people need them to do. Um, and so part of the challenge, I think, for us all is in some ways, how do you get the more recent generation devices back um, refurbished in such a way that you know, they can be used because things like at least 80% battery life, um, which is something we test for whenever we talk about and, and deliver second life devices is really important because you know, it's just not gonna work otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. That's what Michael was saying in the, in the chat there. And how do we get all those devices out of people's bottom drawers? I know, I'm, yeah. guilty, guilty, guilty. I, know. I, I think one so, of the things, one of the things, though, I think that that is that there's a whole lot of barriers around that for, for individuals. So, you know, for people, it might be because, you know, you think you might give it to your dad or to your cousin or to whoever, you know, or you because you think maybe you might use it again or because you're not sure how to so how to um, get rid of the, the, the photos that are still on it. You're still storing them there. You know, all of those different things that kind of get in the way of individuals donating things. And so I think actually what, we, what we're what we trying to understand more of is how often do actually corporate organisations that are more likely to, to distribute those kind of um, you know, get re, reuse their or get get rid of their old devices every couple of years. Like, you know, they're the, still the newer devices that we could continue to use. So I think, how do we actually find out what's the scale of that? What's the information about how often people do that and how we might actually get those larger corporates and government organisations to be able to donate devices so that they are newer, so that they are able to be reused and have a longer life. So I think that's that's a significant challenge. And I know there's a whole lot of barriers um, around, around that as well. I know Caroline knows that very well. So, um, but I think that's definitely, you know, a, a focus because individuals there, there's a whole lot of barriers, but um, even though that would be wonderful, but I think that, um, you know, if we really want to make a difference at scale, it's how do we get into those large organisations? 
Yeah, and Caroline, do you want to pick that up as well on device quality? I've seen the way your team's working. <laughs> to, yeah, to look, I think quality. it's just being very selective. I think to, to Jess's point, you know, we 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 do find that you get the efficiency when you're when you've got a you know corporate corporates on board because you get more stable levels of quality um, and generally a similar age. You know, when you start getting individuals, um, they can be quite they can fluctuate quite significantly in terms of the quality how long they've had them in their bottom drawer for you know how long they've been using them as a storage device um and actually just the logistics of collecting them is expensive in, in itself you know so from a kind of social enterprise perspective you want to get them you know most efficient processes in place to collect to collect those devices i mean we get about three percent return rates on devices that we issue so it's you know we're getting really good um kind of stable and good quality devices, um, which we are quite selective about, you know, in terms of the ones that we issue. So, um, and we do offer battery upgrades, you know, for for individuals or not for profits who are looking for extended battery life. So there's things that we can do to try and improve that quality, because as you said, the last thing you want is frustration that then just um, in increases the digital exclusion. Fantastic. That's that's probably a good segue on to talking about the whole the whole piece about device acquisition, um, and I think a lot of people either as individuals, you know, or as large corporates or as government, when when you've got devices that you think you can donate, you know, what's what's the best way for people to go about that? Either you know, an individual with one device, or a, or a government department, or a corporate that might have thousands of devices. Kind of how how do they best go about doing that? How do they find the organisations to donate them to? Um, you know, what what are the benefits for the organisations of of doing that? Can I can I just say that I think that that we've already seen in the chat panel as well. There are a range of different organisations doing this. Um, so you know, at at different levels. Um, so I know I've seen Annette from the Reconnect project on online, and clearly Workventures has been doing this for forty three years. Um, and so there are a range of different organisations that are already doing this, um, but 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 not at kind of scale. And I think that's the key thing for us and why we're really keen to be having this conversation is what is the system we need to create to enable this to happen easily? And because I don't think there is an easy way at the moment. I know there's a piece of work that's about to be, uh, that ACAN, our, our friends at ACAN are going to do around looking at what are the different um, programs available because there's multiple. Um, but actually, because, you know, mobile must is there as well, but for recycling, not refurbishing. Um, so I think there, there's definitely opportunities, but it's going to take all of us. And I think that's what we're really interested in is looking at how how might we create a national model that it enables it for um, to make it easy for both corporates um, and organisations, large organisations, to, don to donate and to get those devices to people in need um, as quickly as possible um, and as cost efficiently as possible. And we know, you know, that there's a few um, organisations that so give it, and Good Three Hundred and Sixty have been doing some work around this as well. So, you know, there's multiple. All of us are seeing the need, and I think it's really important that we actually start to think about how do we work together to make this a really sustainable approach and to make sure that we actually get that you know the impact that we're all looking for which is to make sure that we're fixing the digital divide. Absolutely. Caroline did you want to jump in? Oh yeah I couldn't agree more Jess I think you know a lot of the the barriers have been mentioned in the chat but um it's maybe just worthwhile kind of reiterating them so leasing comes up a lot you know companies have leasing arrangements in place um so quite often companies have the intent, but, you know, overcoming the internal complexity of having a lease is quite often just a bit too much for people to overcome. So that can be a bit of a barrier to getting um, end of life corporate devices, um, existing commercial arrangements. So again, I think that's been picked up in the chat, the commercial buybacks. So um, that can be difficult if you've got a, an arrangement in place at a corporate where they're already making money from end of life devices and you're asking them to give that up. Um, that can be a bit tricky um, to overcome, you know, from an internal stakeholder perspective. And then I think the last one is recycling. Um, and there are some systemic factors in place around the NTCRS, which is the National TV and Computer Recycling Scheme, which provides credits for the recycling of devices. 
but it doesn't provide uh, credits for the reuse of them. So it actually disincentivizes reuse versus recycling, unfortunately. Um, it was picked up in the Productivity Commission um, about a year or so ago in the Right to Repair report, um, where they actually recommended that reuse was treated. Um, it was addressed in the NTCRS, but it's not been implemented yet. Um, so I think they're kind of a range of the factors that we find challenging in getting devices. And then once you actually get the device, I think big challenges we find are mobiles being locked um, and just, you know, damage or the device specs being a bit too low. Um, but I completely um, agree with Jess's point that there's a lot of stakeholders on this call that are doing similar things. How do we collectively try to address it, this issue systemically? And Jess, I don't know if we, if we how much we can talk about it, but we are looking at... Um, a report um, commissioned by a, a lovely um, pro bono partner um, who's looking at um, some of the underlying kind of landscape and the, the size of the opportunity and some of those vested interests that might potentially be blocking um, increasing the funnel of devices that we potentially could be um, pulling into the, the you know, the, the donated, um, the donated pool of devices. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm going to, Kevin, whether you want to add particularly, you, you talked about incentives and kind of would, would love to hear that side. So there's the, you know, there's the, yes, we should be doing this for the environmental reasons and reuse yeah. and obviously social impact and digital inclusion, but what else, whether it be incentives for, you know, individuals or organisations to, to donate their devices back? Well, look, I, I think there's two aspects that that, that I would um, think about here. One is, one is awareness. Um, you know, this is a fantastic forum. We, you know, as, as everyone here on this uh, forum uh, and more and, and people that are in this community need to continue to talk about this more because so often I think, you know, people are just not aware of the fact that there is this divide and, and the types and examples of communities and individuals that, that need support. Um, so that's number one. But what that helps lead to is also then giving people the option, uh, both corporates as well as individuals, giving people the option to be able to support. And, and we know through, um, you know, very, very simple um, types of tools where people can um, donate to, to different causes, um, you know, how, how much people will get behind things when, when they're both aware and it's easy for them to do so. Um, so I think that's a responsibility on uh, particularly corporates, um, you know, uh, companies like, like, like Kingfisher, uh, who I work with, but also mobile phone carriers, for example, their ability um, to be able to not just make aware their consumers and their enterprise customers of um, this opportunity and 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 this um, uh, this challenge, but then also give them the flexibility uh, in a seamless way to be able to help. Um, uh, I think I think that could make a really big difference as well. And we're talking to to different carriers around the world uh, on that front as well. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. And wonderful conversation going on in the going on in the chat with uh, so many organisations working in this space. It's fantastic. Um, Rhonda, please, if you've got a burning question, to put it in the the Q and A the Q and A box. But I'll, I'll do my best to try and work through some of the ones in the chat as well. Um, but we might move some of the questions in the in the Q and A. Uh, and this, this one's for for Caroline, but could probably open it up. Um, beyond as well, and so asking what what your experience is of supply versus demand. This is tenure at ACAN, and I think a great question: Is it harder to source the devices or to reach the people who need them? Thanks, David. Um, oh, tricky one. I think the getting a, a sustainable supply is probably the hardest. Um, it depends. You go through ebbs and flows. And right now we've been quite lucky. We've got a really supportive partner I mentioned already in the form of um, Westpac, and they have been really fantastic in providing us with device donations. So um, that's been quite a sustainable supply of devices for some time. Um, I think, um, yeah, so I would say that getting that security of supply is the, the biggest issue. Um, and then working with partners that really understand the the way that devices need to be distributed um, is not necessarily, you know, dropping a device on someone's doorstep and then kind of walking away. Um, but it's actually much more complex than that um, because that's the last, you know, it could be as useful as a piece of plastic if you just provide someone with a device and you, they don't have any of the tools or the, the coaching or the skills or the connectivity. Um, so finding partners where, you know, they really understand what's required to truly overcome digital exclusion um 
and you know work together to kind of build up that like I mentioned earlier the kind of um wraparounds of solutions which address the unique challenges of the people that we're working with because it does take time you know you can't um it does take a little bit of exploration to try and figure out um what's required to to really address the key challenges and you know Jess I'm sure the um Good Things Foundation get that a lot, you know, with your network of partners really on the ground and you really understand the unique needs of the people yeah. that you're supporting. Um, so I think there's never a shortage, as we know, of um, demand in terms of um, getting, you know, people that need to be helped out of digital exclusion. But there is, you know, obviously a requirement for, for funding to, to really address it properly. And that can be the challenge. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd support all that you're saying, um, Caroline. I think it's definitely harder to get the devices um, and, the, and the money to be able to get it out to people than than it is to to the, for the demand. We know the demand is there 100%. Um, and I do think that it is about how do we combine all of the areas that we know are important around digital exclusion and address all of those at once because unless we are able to give people a device with some affordable data and the skills and support, um, you know, support to, to build their skills and confidence, then that's the challenge, right? And I think that's what, um, you know, we certainly saw through um, through the Be Connected grants is that the that it needed to be not just you purchase a device and give it to somebody, but actually how you support them to learn how to use it and then support them on that journey to make sure that they're actually connecting um, with people um, and that they're building on those skills. So it's not just a kind of a here's how to use the device. It's actually, well, what do you want to do, actually? Because that, that's why we're talking about digital inclusion. It's actually so that people are fully included in the community and in the society, right? So that's the ultimate outcome. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the model that the, our UK team have put together, which is that combination of all three, um, is really the, what we're, we're looking at. Um, as well how do you make sure and then people can choose what what they need you know because as you say some people don't just can't afford a device but actually the skills come really quickly you know so they may not need that support whereas other people you know you give them a, an ipad and it takes a significant amount of time to actually work out how to use it and multiple times of repeating how to do these things. So I think it is, an, it's an individual um, situation, but if we're able to provide the three, I think that's that's the best option. Fantastic, thanks. Thanks, Jess. It's a great, great question there from Mary asking around, how do we ensure donated devices remain in the local community? And I don't know if you want to pick that up when I first, Kevin, but kind of people thinking about, you know, are these devices going to go offshore? How do we, how do we keep them within the communities that these devices have been given? I don't know if you've got if you've got comments, Kevin, and then happy to open it up. Yeah, look, uh, again, I think, you know, probably um, Jess and Carolyn have some good ideas around this as well. But, you know, for, for me, one of the things is having programs where accessible device well, devices are accessible. Um, to people. So the, the example uh, that, that, I, that I gave before on, on Belong um, and having an active um, secondhand device market that customers um, uh, can trust um, because I think, you know, we probably all experience in our first experience uh, buying stuff off eBay, which sometimes just doesn't give you the comfort, right, that um, uh, it, it, you'd really like. And so the ability for whether it's us or, or other providers in the market um, being able to provide things like 12 month warranties on these devices with guarantees that they've been tested that things like battery life are at least 80 percent um, but they're still affordable you know um, and 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 therefore more accessible to people I think is is definitely a way um, I think it also is important that um, we have both corporations uh, mobile phone carriers and the like um, think about and contribute to uh, programs that are locally based, you know, and so um, you know that that's that's something that, from an awareness perspective, I think we can continue to lift as well. Yeah, I think um, so. So just as a, a, an experience from the UK again around the donation of devices to people in need, because um, I'm not sure quite which which part of the which kind of direction the questions from, but um, but certainly. 
um, the experience there, there was concern from people who were donating about whether these devices would then just be unsold or given away or, you know, that kind of thing. And actually they really haven't seen that. They may have seen one one of those devices trying to be resold, over 22,000 of them. So I just don't think that that actually this is filling a need that people actually need the device. So it's for individuals that need this um, to be able to, to participate in the community. So I think that is um, that, that, that actually it's not turned out to be a challenge at all um, for people. Did you want to add to that one, Caroline? Um, I only to say that I guess we we address it by working with accredited not for profits um, because they really understand the 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 specific needs of the people that are being supported. You know, it's 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 difficult to have that in depth knowledge of those specific needs um, unless you're working with a community organisation or a not for profit that is kind of got that in-depth knowledge um otherwise you might be potentially throwing too much as Jess said you know it could be someone that actually has digital skills and doesn't really need all they need is a device or the, you know the reverse which is you're um you're giving them too little so it, it really the best in our experience the best way to address that is by working with the the partners who really know the specific needs of the people that are being supported and um I'm trying to think if we've got any outside of I don't think there's any that we work with that are based outside of Australia currently anyway and um, they're all um, Australian based. Right and and you might want to pick up Caroline there's been quite a lot of discussion in the chat around providing opportunities for people in refurbishment so whether that's young people that's people struggling to get into the workforce whether that's people with disabilities whether you want to talk to some of your experience there. Yeah like we've we've long used it as a, a training ground um, so we take on IT uh, young, normally young, but not always, um, people that are doing IT traineeships. Um, and generally, our trainees come from quite diverse cohorts. Um, and what they do is they pick up a, um, IT certificate three or four um, and work um, in our refurbished centre and also in the IT train tech support, the digital coaching, digital coaches, and which gives them a really great training ground because it's providing that real hands on, you know, um, to, to, to technical training but also working with people which as everyone knows is you know sometimes the hardest thing so they're actually handling quite difficult calls a lot of the time from people who might be really frustrated you know who potentially have never had access to tech before and it's just such an amazing training ground for them I have to say all of our trainees come out you know with an amazing um, set of experiences and you know I think one of our most recent examples that IT trainee had about three went for three jobs and got two of them you know they've just got an, an incredible set of skills it's both soft and and kind of technical skills that comes out of that IT qualification yeah no, that's wonderful thank you Caroline and there's many great examples going on in the in the chat there as well um David I, could I um, could I add to that as yeah, well you know we're um just as another example where we're working with a local school um in Victoria around um in collaboration with their First Nations program for that school uh, and offering sort of work experience cadetships, um, you know, in conjunction with that school so that we've got the ability to, to enhance, I guess, their, their program as well. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, this, this one might be for Jess, but happy to, to open it up. I, I loved this one. This was way earlier in the, in the chat stream, but I just thought a, a really great comments and questions. So uh, this was saying, I work for a men's shed where many of the members express fear and hatred of digital. Do you have a way of addressing this? And we've been talking all this technical <laughs> stuff around devices, but I just thought that was a fantastic question to take us right back to the heart. <laughs> oh, we do what we do. Uh... <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, look, I mean, we, we have a number of men's sheds in our network. And so I have heard this a number of times and also been on radio talking to people and had chat. Um, Talkback Radio is the place to find out where people just do not want to be on on tech. So I think, I mean, what we always talk about in terms of building people's confidence and interest in being online is actually about finding what is the thing that they're interested in in life. Because what we know, and as my lights go off, because we're very, very environmental here. Um, so I think we know that, um, you know, technology is a tool. Technology is a tool to enhance our lives. And so um, it's not it's not the be all and end all. So if you're really interested um, as a men's shed, 
in um, in you know learning how to do new um, you know create new things. We had one men shed who thought it was a fantastic idea to be able to get um, a 3D printer to be able to donate things to people in need. So they would create, you know, little prosthesis and hands and things like that to send overseas. And really they wanted to give back to their community. This was something that was really interesting to them and it was actually a way of encouraging people then to go, well, what else do we need to know to be able to use this 3D printer? Oh, okay, so maybe we need to start at the start. So what is actually a computer? How do you access that? What's an email address? So I think it's really about what's what's exciting for people in their lives. And if you can find that one thing, we often talk about it as a hook, um, you know, finding that one thing that people really love to do and saying, well, this is what you can do by doing with that online. So, um, you know, whether it's child times, it's, you know, it's men shed, learning how to make something new or it's... Um, you know, it's gardening, whatever it is, I think there's a way of encouraging people um, to, to give it a go. But if they don't have the right device and they don't have data and it is frustrating, you know, then it is, you know, if their first experience is not a good one, then it can be a real challenge. So I think that's why, you know, bringing that back to the devices conversation, it's really important that people have the right tech um, to be able to do what they want to do. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. There's also there's a few questions around a couple on NTCRS, the sort of the right to repair discussion. Um, but maybe if people have any comments on the the regulatory environment and what's you know what's what's helping or hindering some of the the reuse and and refurbishment and recycling we're talking about. And who wants to take that? Whether that's a, a Caroline or a Kevin or. Sorry, I was skimming through the questions to try and figure out <laughs> my head. <laughs> um, look, I can I can co comment a little bit on the NTCRS, just in the sense that um, we we are not a recycler, so we're not registered on the, under the NTCRS. I think you have to be a um, an accredited recycler, so we are outside of the NTCRS. Um, but yeah, I am aware that it it's potentially causing some creating some barriers to, to organizations from donating um, devices for reuse, as I said, because it's, there is a financial benefit to, to recycling under the scheme. Um, and I guess we're, we're trying to, I think this is part of what um, Jess and I are working on with this um, consultancy piece of work is to really dig underneath that a bit more and understand whether, you know, what the levers are of using the NTCRS or potentially to amend the NTCRS um, to really open up um, open up more um, supply for, for digital inclusion purposes. My suspicion, and it's difficult to get this data, um, is that there it's diverting quantities of devices from reuse for, you know, digital inclusion reuse, but we just don't have a sense of that scale. And that's really the piece that we're trying to get the support on is to try and um, identify, you know, the, like I mentioned, the total pot of, um, of devices that are being used in Australia per annum or refreshed per annum and all of that, the quantum which are being diverted through the means of the NTCRS. And look, don't get me wrong, I think I think it's been around since 2011 and obviously came from a good place because it was trying to create, you know, um, uh, more of a circular economy and reduce e-waste. Um, I think the unintentional consequence of it is that it's creating some friction when it comes to the availability of devices for digital inclusion reuse. I don't know if, Kevin, you want to add to that? And, and Kevin, no, Kevin, that must have been... Sorry, Kevin, I was just say, if you want to pick up, there's yeah. a bit in the chat as well around the whole repair environment. And I know there's been discussion on, you know, Apple in Europe being forced to kind of allow more of uh, access to their devices and um, a bit of a groundswell in, in the US and clearly a desire in Australia to allow <laughs> to allow more access and refurb of, of mobile devices. Yeah, look, and, you know, um, there has been a challenge, no question, right? Um, uh, no, no question about things like getting access to uh, genuine Apple parts, you know, to be able to repair. Um, Apple have long had a, um, uh, I guess, a certified pre-owned kind of uh, environment where, you know, they only provide certification um, under very certain, yeah, under very strict circumstances, which can sometimes, you know, um, provide challenges. 
um, to, to people having trust, I guess, in the devices that are being refurbished and repaired. I think that is breaking down to a degree. Um, you know, there, there is a, a much greater understanding now that um, if you've got a reputable, you know, repair or organisation, particularly mobile phone carriers, you know, um, ha having a role to play there in effectively certifying, you know, that they're, they're going to stand behind a, uh, a refurbished device, um, even if it's not technically certified by Apple, for example, um, you know, that, that, can, that can play a big role. Um, and so how carriers get involved um, in that ecosystem, whether themselves or with, you know, reputable partners who are prepared to, to do it properly and can get audited um, and provide warranties, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that can potentially help significantly as well overcome, you know, some of those, some of those barriers. But absolutely, you know, regulatory environment uh, and regulators can play a role. Uh, another example, I guess, is in Australia, we've got a very fragmented secondhand dealer's licence um, framework, uh, which many of you know about. Uh, it's state by state. There's no national framework, uh, which means that to be able to comply, you need to look at every single state and there's different rules, which you know can sometimes be a challenge as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. I think there's a really good comment in the chat made as well, talking about just this increasing demand on social workers, support workers, case managers, like like so many things, this is just layered on top of the work that people are doing day to day to help people in need. This isn't, you know, formally part of their job. They do what they can to, to help people, but it really needs to be recognised that the efforts that are, that are going on and not just assumed that people have the time to do this or even necessarily have the capacity or, or skills to help. Um, but we know workers in the sector are always going to try and help. But uh, any comments about, about that and what we could do to address that? Oh, absolutely. I saw that comment too. And I was, uh, I was really interested. I mean, I think that that is a challenge and it's libraries, it's, you know, it's community centres, it's, you know, it's a range of different organisations that are being required to do this. And actually, you know, for, for some of the people in our network and certainly community centres and libraries, People are just forwarded there from Centrelink, from, um, you know, from, uh, you know, banks, from, you know, anywhere that has this digital transformation agenda that need people to be able to get supported to do that. And they don't have the time. I kind of referred off to people really quickly. And I, and I think that ultimately we need to recognise the time that it takes. And so, you know, Be Connected funding is um, is small um, for lots of organisations, but it does um, contribute some, uh, you know, it building capacity in community organisations to be able to deliver this program. So whether that's, you know, being able to cover some training expenses or being able to, you know, purchase devices, whatever it is that's going to help people to be able to do that. So I, I mean, certainly need um, there to be an expansion in digital inclusion funding across the country country and the recognition of, of that. Having said that, though, I mean, I do think ultimately, you know, for us to really fix the digital divide, we need our community organisations to feel confident to be able to do that. And so, David, I know that's the work that Info Exchange has been doing for a long time is like looking at what's the need in the sector and how do we build capacity in there. So I think, you know, we need to continue that work alongside this work to make sure that um, people feel confident to be able to support others um, because it is continuing to be about, you know, accessing the community. So I always say that when I was a, a newly graduated social worker and a family support worker, I'd be working with people to, to walk to Centrelink and go there and be able to access and what do you need to ask and all of those kinds of things and standing with people. And now people need to be able to use MyGov, right? So it's it's the same thing, accessing that support, but it's actually using technology. So it's shifting that, that approach. Um, I think that we need to make sure that that's recognised and that there's support happening for people to be able to do that. Absolutely. I think Mary just said in the chat, cost shifting at its best. And I think, you know, yeah. paying, paying what it takes is the other way to, is the other yes, way to put that. That's it. <laughs> Caroline, did you want to did you want to jump in on that one as well? Um, yeah, just to add, I think we've got a couple of models that we've tested. One is, as I mentioned, the digital coaches doing the call. So it's either an, it's either an outbound or an inbound call once um, the end user has received their device. So it's kind of a proactive setup. But the other thing that um, we have done with a couple of not for profits is um, where the individual, particularly with elderly people, they they need someone physically there. Um, we actually do like a three-way 
call. So um, we have our digital coaches on the phone talking with the potentially the elderly person and the um, and maybe a community worker to help them physically, you know, so that the community worker doesn't have to be skilled and everything, you know, they, they, we understand that they don't um, have necessarily have the full um, set of suite of skills to set someone up. But we're kind of coaching them who are physically on site to then help the the person, the end user to to get set up. So that's something that works quite quite well. But it's obviously a lot more hands on. And as you know, the comments on the in the chat are um, a bit of cost shifting. But I guess what it does, it supports that that um, community worker, so they feel like they're enabled and equipped to have that conversation. Fantastic, thank you. It's also a good question or, or comment there saying we find people are being sold devices with no instructions on how to use them and saying telcos should take some responsibility here, but you know it's probably broader than that as well. Um, we've just talked about the role of community organisations in, in that. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on, comment on that. Yeah, I mean, what, what we see certainly is that, you know, well, I don't know, the last time I bought advice, there was no instructions, you have to go online to get the instructions, right? So, I mean, if you don't know how to go online, it's pretty tricky. Um, and I think it is, it is about how do we make sure that people are able to access the support in the way that they, um, in the way that fit, feels best for them, because it is actually about the trust that people have. Um, and, you know, we know that community organisations are highly trusted by people. So, um, again, it's how do we make sure. I love I love the model of the three-way, you know, the tech support alongside the community support. How, how might we, we do that? Um, but it's the ongoing support that needs to happen because, I, I mean, if I think about, you know, the work we're doing with um, people with intellectual disability, it's not just the once that you need to learn how to do this, it's the ongoing piece. And so it is about how do we make sure that they're, that is built in and people feel confident enough to be able to support people um, with the, the essential needs that they have um, when they provide that support to them in other ways. I, I do wonder, David, and, and you know, um, this is this is more from a personal perspective. I, I wonder how can we leverage, you know, um, what I probably call the youth uh, in our society, you know, in in this in a, in a more engaging uh, fun um, and ultimately constructive way. I mean, when, when I think about um, some of the things that I got taught by my kids during COVID and I was homeschooling them for 18 months, you know, I, I think, well, and, and they're in primary school. So, you know, uh, th think about the amazing talent that we've got you know, in our young people um, that could that could help in this way. So finding ways in which I think we could leverage that uh, would be really exciting, I think. Absolutely. And I've, I've loved some of some of the programs I've seen in public housing communities, for example, where you're teaming up young people with uh, with seniors. And so mm -hmm. on, on one hand, the young people think they're doing all of the, the teaching to the seniors. Actually, there's a lot of learning coming back in the other direction as well, which is through a lot of those conversations. That are, that absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And just, I mean, to add to that, I think lots of our community partners have done, I think I've just seen Sonia from Tasmania, who's um, who's done that kind of program um, in their local communities, connecting schools as well. But the eSafety Commission has recently re um, released a young mentors program, which is doing exactly that, trying to connect um, young people in schools with community organisations to support older people. So um, definitely check that out if you haven't haven't seen it already. Yeah. And Caroline, do you want to talk to the support piece as well? And this is partly me giving a plug for, for WorkVentures, but I know, I know WorkVentures provides a really comprehensive support service with a refurb device. And I think it is really important for people to think about when they're purchasing a device, you know, on behalf of or for, you know, somebody without that kind of level of skill, how they're going to get the ongoing support rather than just it's been drop shipped or turned up at your house. What do you do next? Yeah. Yes, David. Um, we we have a little sticker on each of the devices uh, with a phone number because you know that's just in our experience the way that it works best. Um, and what we tend to do is we, like I said, we've got these this team of digital coaches who are the IT trainees that are going through their IT traineeship. Um, and the way that we find it works best is even if we're providing, um, for example, connectivity, which we don't do directly, but we do with partner organisations. Um they have one number to call. And so where that really works is if you're digitally excluded, you don't know quite often if it's a hardware, software, internet connectivity problem. You just know that your thing is not working and it's annoying you. So we give them one phone number to call, which then the um, our digital coaches will triage because they'll identify as this hardware, software, internet. And in the back end, if it's internet, we resolve that problem as opposed to... Um, 
them having to then you know pass them over to a telco to try and resolve it we we will do that um and triage it so that it's one one throat to choke essentially um with everything that's digital inclusion related um and that that approach has been working quite well for the last kind of 12 months or so yeah fantastic and just while, while you're while you're there there's, um kevin's just uh helped kind of prompt on a on a question from anna around circular economy for for fixed devices rather than just mobile devices and i know that's something you've done a lot of thinking about as well caroline i'm sorry i'm just looking at that question oh. Yeah, so, so so around the around the circular economy, and um, Kevin talked about that in the mobile context, but you know what that looks like in the you know in the desktops and and fixed devices and laptops. Yeah, absolutely. So I think yeah, everything that we've so um, oh, as in fixed phone devices, is that oh, what you're I, well, I yeah, fixed. I think sort of uh, modems, um, routers. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, those okay. sorts of devices, because I know certainly um, you know, I, I haven't done much work in that space. We focused mainly on mobility, and I think often there is a big focus on mobility, uh, given the secondhand um, market that's available. Um, and mobile seems to come first to mind, I guess, when people are thinking about digital devices. But um, I'm actually personally interested in this question as well, in terms of you know, um, is there a is there an important economy there, if you like, for um, fixed devices, routers, modems? um you know as well um or or is the focus mostly on mobiles in terms of what demands out there that's yeah. really interesting yeah it's, so, Caroline, it's yeah. something that we're on the lookout for so if there's anyone that uh, does have um access to um modem devices that are kind of worthy of refurbishment we um we have been looking it's kind of something that's relatively new to us um but so, so far i've had small quantities but nothing um nothing kind of um continuous mm. and i think modems are diff more difficult to get hold of because people tend yeah. To them, yeah. um and not provide them back to the telcos because we have had some conversations about telcos and whether they get the modems back themselves and most of them said no um so it's trying to find that source of supply really mm. i don't know it's and, I, and I wonder yeah. whether sorry david i wonder whether hot spots so uh, you know, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots uh, potentially uh, as good, if not sometimes better, uh, uh, an opportunity um, for people because they may not have the ability to get a fixed line um, depending on their circumstance. Um, yeah, the Wi-Fi so. devices, that's kind of, in our experience, you're right, Kevin, with the types of cohorts that we're working with and sometimes the, um, you know, the, they're moving around a bit more, um, but the... Um, the mobile connectivity is is um, more useful, um, and so we have been using Wi-Fi devices. Again, the challenge is that sometimes they are network locked, so there's quite a lot of complexities with you know if you get a bunch of devices which are network locked, they may not be that useful if they are not aligned to the network that we are working with. Yeah. So yeah. Next. Yeah, and I know I was, I was just going to make the comment. I know Andy Whelan, who's on our governance and strategy committee for the ADIA, who leads Start Broadband. This is he's highlighted this as a massive issue in providing when he's providing donated internet connections and reduced cost internet connections to members of the community. It is it's the router that becomes the the single biggest cost, and and really difficult to to provision up front. Jess, did you want to did you want to jump in? I was just I was just going to say I I think that the the experience of the team in the UK around the use of modems is people are donating them, but they're not they're not being refurbished, so they're actually being then um, used for recycling purposes, and and the funding from that is then reinvested into the refurbishment of, of devices then to go out. So it's not because they're using the mobile do, m mobile data um, rather than the fixed line, definitely. So. Um, yeah, it's still part of the the system, but not but not as you know they're being redistributed. Fantastic, and I think just acknowledging there's been some great more comments on the router space in the chat as well. Um, there's also been a lot of discussion in the chat on kind of access to to data, and that's probably a whole discussion for another day. Um, but thank you to Alison from Optus who very generously provided her email address in the chat, and you might be getting many many emails, Alison, on the Donate Your Data program that Optus is running. It's a fantastic program. But just wondering whether there's any quick comments from the the panelists on thinking about data in the context of of devices and how to how to solve that challenge. Mm. 
I mean, I, I think that um, certainly the, the the work of the, the team in the UK around the National Data Bank is actually getting multiple telcos to donate into the one place. And so, yes, the work that Optus is doing is, is brilliant. And in fact, I'm pretty sure Helen um, got the idea of the National Data Bank from the work that Optus is doing when she was out here. So, um, but actually they've had donations from multiple different telcos. So from Vodafone, from Virgin Media O2. So, and and then that's distributed out to people. So, I think because not everybody is on Optus, not everybody is on Telstra, not everybody is, you know, so it's actually about how do we make sure that there is also choice within that that opportunity for people um, and, you know, without them having to change providers. So, you know, I think the work that Optus is doing is fantastic. And what else can we do to make it, make sure that it's, it's, it's broader than that? And again, it's that kind of systems approach so that we know that community organisations don't have to then go to, um, know where to go to be able to navigate the system about getting that kind of donated data because that's the difficult thing for small community organisations that are part of our network. They don't have the time or capacity to be going and navigating that as much as they would really love to. So I think it's how do we make that simpler and make it across the system? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the other the other resource to, to call out here is um, is ACAN as well. Our friends at ACAN provide some some great guides on the ACAN website around different different sources for this. At the Info Exchange, for example, we facilitate the Telstra prepaid top up program, which is a free program. But again, as Jess said, it's how to find all of these programs and um, and connect them connect them together. Um, so while more work is done on that, certainly um, direct people to the to the ACAN website for some of those resources. And Caroline, I don't know if you wanted to comment on, I know you've done some bundling of, of data with the, with the devices, but there's been any experiences from that that you'd like to comment on? Um, thanks, David. I think, look, mainly the, the point I made earlier just about the transient nature, really understanding the, the, the cohorts that we're working with and making sure that the data options are suited to those cohorts. You know, so for example, um, some of the cohorts that we're working with have got that kind of high trans, trans, transient nature. Um, and so therefore, you know, using an NBN fixed line, for example, wouldn't really be the right solution. Um, but other cohorts, that might be the right solution. So it's it's kind of, again, one solution doesn't work for all. Um, and understanding, again, one of the big things that we um, have learned over the last six months is really educating the cohorts on the use of the data. So, for example, um, I hope the Smith family won't mind me sharing, but one of the big things that, you know, we've worked on with them is really um, improving the family's understanding of how much data is used for which different activities, you know, so really breaking it down into this is how much Netflix you would watch, you know, in one hour, this is the amount of data that would equate to, just to give it really, and how much YouTube or just little simple things that people understand. Um, and that has led to some really great outcomes in terms of families not running out of data by halfway through the month. Um, and, you know, including that in the, the packages that we send out. So we have a little education leaflet that actually gives that information around, um, you know, what data equates to. Um, and when we do those setup calls, we actually, that is part of the call. It's really that educational piece around what is data used for? When can you expect it to be consumed the most? If you go HD or 4K, you know, you're not going to have very much left very quickly. So just really, you know, helping people understand that so that, you know, it's, it's they're learning it in one, month one as opposed to month three. Fantastic. Thanks, Carla. And we're, we're almost at time. Kevin, I don't know if you want to jump in. I imagine the work you're doing through the, the Second Life programs, for example, with telcos, is it's it's very much connected with data, is it? Is, is that what you see? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, I think the other thing I'd say is that um, I think we're, we're fortunate in Australia now that, that all the major carriers have moved to a world where, um, yeah, there's no more excess data charges. Um, that's a really positive thing for, for the community at large and a good thing for the industry. Um, from a customer experience perspective, so um, at a minimum, there's that there's that guarantee. I think, um, but I think Carolyn's point spot on in terms of educating, you know, uh, users, particularly in these communities, as to what data usage, you know, um, is going to be driven by what types of applications and um, and activity, um, so that they can manage, you know, um, their their activity in the most optimal way. 
Fantastic, thanks, Kevin. So we probably we probably need to draw a line under under the conversation now. But it's been a, I think it's been a wonderful session. So uh, thank you, first of all, to uh, to everybody that's that's attended. I think there's been a fantastic stream of discussion going on in the chat, and it's great to see the the sharing and connections that have been that have been going on there. Um, a huge thank you to uh, to our speakers today, to Caroline, Jess, and and Kevin, and being so generous in sharing your time and and sharing your your experiences in in this space. Um, a big shout out to, to Caitlin from the ADIA. You can probably see her without a, without a picture down the bottom, but these events would not happen without the amazing work that, uh, that Caitlin does behind the scenes to, to organise them. So, so thank you very much to, to Caitlin. A reminder to please sign up to our ADIA newsletter if you're not already, and then you'll get a, you'll get a copy of this session, as well as we'll do a roundup as best we can of all of the resources that have been shared in the, in the chat as well. Um, but uh, with that, I want to thank you, uh, thank you everybody for your uh, for your support during uh, 2022. Um, hope you all have a a wonderful break, and we look forward to seeing you at our meetups back in uh, back in the new year. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks to you too, David, for hosting. Yeah. It's great to have you. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jess. Thanks all.